Hey, Gregory Carlson here for the Calculus Building, and we just learned about this very, very important idea called the derivative. And so let's look at the formal definition. Now, there's such a thing as the derivative at a point and the derivative as a function. And we're going to look at both. Uh, this, these two definitions are the derivative as a function. And so I just wanted to go ahead and give them to you now so you can start to, to memorize them. Notice that this f prime of x means the derivative function. And this is Newton's notation. And we're going to look at both Newton's notation and Leibniz's notation in this class. Um, notice that this was the one we were familiar with. We were taking the limit. Now this is really important. If I take away this limit, that formula right there is the average rate of change. Okay, That formula is the average rate of change over the interval between x and c. And that's what we were doing with Nero's stop sign. So when we put this limit on here and let c get closer and closer and closer, or actually let x get closer and closer and closer to c, that's when you're finding that instantaneous rate of change at that point c. So what about this one on the right? Well, it turns out that both of these definitions are equivalent, and I hope you can see why. If we, in this definition, we have some tiny little amount we're adding to x, and then letting that tiny little amount we've added go to zero. That's the same idea as our x value approaching the value we wanted. Approaching the value we want is the same as adding a little bit to our value and then letting that little bit go to zero. I think most scholars agree that this definition over here is easier to simplify and easier to work with, and so this is the one we're mainly going to be using. So now let's do two application problems of this. We're going to do two approximations of the derivative. And so here we go. And this is going to be a little bit of work, about the same amount of work as when we found limits in earlier videos. We have this function f of x equals 5x squared. And you can see by this table that they want us to approximate the derivative at the point x equals 4. Now this, by the way, is also called the difference quotient. And so that's a good uh, piece of vocab to know. So here's how it works. We have different values of h that we're going to test. And so in all of these examples, x is going to equal 4, and h are going to be, be these values over here. And we're going to calculate it for each one of these values. So let's do the first one. So here's how I would plug 4 and 2 into this. We're going to find f of 6 minus f of 4 divided by 2. So let me explain where I got those numbers from. This is f of x plus h. And we know that x is 4 and h is 2. So 4 plus 2 is 6. We're going to subtract f of x. And again, x was 4. And we're dividing by h, and h was 2. So that's where the 6, the 4, and the 2 came from. They came from x plus h, x, and h. So let's actually calculate that. We're going to plug all of these values into the function. So you do 6 squared, which is 36, times 5. So f of 6 is 180, minus f of 4. We just plug in 4 into our function. 4 squared is 16, times 5 is equal to 80. And all of that will be divided by our h value, which is 2. So 180 minus 80 is 100, divided by 2 is equal to 50. So if we have x equals 4 and h equals 2, it looks like our approximate rate of change is 50. But I bet we can do better. Let's do that entire process again, but this time, let's let h equal 1. So we should get a more accurate reading. What do you think we're going to be doing f of? We have x plus h, so 4 plus 1 is 5, minus f of 4, divided by 1 this time, because h equals 1. So plug those numbers into the formula. 5 squared is 25, times 5 is equal to 125. So we're going to get 125 minus, and this f of 4 is always going to be 80. So that's nice. 125 minus 80 over 1. So that's just going to equal 45. So you can see that 50 wasn't a very good approximation. 45 is better. But I think we can do even better. Let's do h equals 0 0.1. So we're going to calculate f of 4.1.
So that's going to be 4.1, because that's x plus h, 4.1 squared times 5. So that's going, this third one is going to be 84.05 minus 80, which is f of 4. And then divided by, this time we're dividing by h, which is 0 0.1. So let's take off the 80, divide by 0 0.1. Uh-oh. And we get 40.5. Made a little mistake on the calculator. So wow, it looks like we're approaching 40 because we get pretty close and it looks like we're getting closer to 40. So let's do this last one. We're going to calculate f of 4.01 x plus h. So four, plug that in. 4.01 squared times 5 is going to equal, this last one is 80.4005 minus f of 4 divided by h. So that's going to, let's take off the 80 and divide by 0 0.01. And we get 40.049999. And I have a feeling that's a floating point calculator error. I have a feeling it should be 40.05, um, but you get the idea. Um, it looks like we're getting closer and closer and closer to 40 as we get as we let h go to as we let um, h go to zero. So my guess is the instantaneous rate of change of this function at the time x equals four is equal to approximately 40. All right, let's do one more of those in this video. I'm going to do this one a little bit quicker than the last one. And what I want you to do is I actually want you to try to pause the video right here and see if you can get the answers to these four on your own. Okay, see if you can do it on your own and then check to see if you get the same thing as me. No, seriously, pause the video, see if you can get it. See if you can get it on your own before I do it. Try it, I think you'll like it. Did you do it? Did you really do it? Okay, I'm going to do it quickly. Again, we're going to want to find or approximate the average rate of change of x equals 4. So once again, we're going to do, this first one is going to be f of 6 minus f of 4 divided by 2, because our h value is 2. So let's clear the calculator. If I plug in 6, I get negative 3 times 6 is negative 18, plus 7 is negative 11, minus f of 4 is going to be negative 12, plus 7 is negative 5, divided by 2. Those two negatives become positives, so I get negative 11 plus 5 is negative 6 over 2, which equals negative 3. That's interesting. Let's try the next one. Let's see. This is going to be f of 5, which is going to be negative 15 plus 7 is negative 8, minus f of 4, which we figured out was negative 5 divided by 1 this time, because h is 1. How strange, we get negative 3 again. Hmm, something weird must be going on. Let's try um, 4.1. So negative 3 times 4.1 is equal to negative 12.3 minus f of 4, we figured out was negative 5 divided by 0 0.1. So let's add 5. Can you see that? Let's add 5. Okay. And divide by 0 0.1. Oops, I must have made a mistake somewhere. Let's try calculating that again. It was, oh, I think I forgot to add 7. So negative 3 times 4.1 Got to make sure you calculate the entire function, plus 7. There we go. That should have been negative 5.3 right there. Sorry about that. See, even the math teacher sometimes makes a mistake. And when we add 5, 
we get negative 0 0.3 and divide by 0 0.1. We get negative 3 again. What is going on? And it turns out if you do it one more time for this last one, you're going to get negative 3 again. If you find f of 4.01 minus f of 4 divided by 0 0.01, you're going to get negative 3 again. So why are we getting negative 3 every time? Do you know the answer? I'll give you a hint. The answer is in the function. What is the rate of change of a line? Would you agree with me that this is a linear function? The rate of change of a linear function is right here. That's the slope. The slope is being times or multiplied by x. And so it makes sense that because that linear function, because it has a constant rate of change, that line is always going to be falling. No matter what interval we take, the instantaneous rate of change is always going to be negative 3. So I hope that makes sense that for this linear function, which I'll graph over here, negative 3x plus 7, there's the y-intercept at 7, and it's down 3 over 1. That's always having a slope of negative 3. So what we found with this different quotient, difference quotient is consistent with what we should expect really for any linear function. The average rate of change or the limit as we approach some value is going to equal just the slope of that line. Hopefully approximating the derivative at a point using this formula makes sense. In the next one, we're actually going to calculate the entire difference quotient for the entire function. And so I will see you there. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Thank you.